This episode is presented by Edge. Edge is our pro-to-pro advisory service, which is all about the macro with a focus on one-to-one engagement with the hedge fund manager, Craig Shapiro, and direct access to LaDuke Trading founder, Samantha LaDuke. For more information about Edge, visit www.laduketrading.com slash edge. Hey, greetings, and thank you so much for joining us for Macro to Micro Power Hour. I'm Samantha LaDuke, founder of laduketrading.com and joined by our macro advisor, edge manager, Craig Shapiro. So we're going to kind of start with a a little update on some economic data uh, leading into non-farm payrolls Friday, because that's definitely kind of the most market moving uh, economic print I think we'll get this week, uh, obviously right before uh, FOMC next week. So let's talk a little bit about that. And then after we go over kind of the major asset classes of, of, of review, we'll open this up so it's an ask us anything type of format. Basically just hit us up in uh, the uh, Zoom Q&A or chat and we'll uh, answer your questions as we get through it. But first, Craig, happy Wednesday. We're not doing this on FOMC day, but uh we're going to get ready for it. Uh, what is your market read right now? Yeah, it's good to uh, good catching up. Um, since um, you know we had uh, something very interesting, I thought, um, with the beige book, I, I mentioned this uh, in a tweet, but um, that came out, I think it was last week. And the Fed, for the first time since March 2008, is basically acknowledging that the economy is slowing. And so, um, and that data runs through the middle of November. So the Fed is seeing something in the economy and the anecdotal uh, parts of that. That's an anecdotal survey um, that is concerning them and they are acknowledging it. And the market is seemingly running with that narrative, uh, I think, in a very, very aggressive way in that it has very rapidly priced in an imminent rate cutting cycle that really begins in March. Um, and so, and, and that that pricing and that, that outlook was exacerbated by the comments from last week from Governor Waller, who in a question from Nick Camarillos about the Taylor rule and whether or not the Fed would be cutting rates or should be cutting rates if inflation falls in order to not become increasingly restrictive as real rates rise, he acknowledged that reality and said, yes, if inflation is falling, uh, we we are we should be cutting rates. And so the market has really taken that comment, the beige book, and, and I think some of the data, and I think it's just gone uh, very aggressively into a uh, Fed is going to cut imminently type of mentality. And and we're seeing that clearly uh, in the rates market where markets are now looking for five rate cuts in 2024. and in equities, equities have taken the 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 rally in fixed income and the fall in yields to basically go go crazy, and that's been you know really since you know obviously the beginning of November, but even more recently, uh, you know through the middle of November and into the beginning of this month, um, in, in light of. Uh, you know, on a multiple expansion theme from a Fed cutting cycle. And so the question is, is the Fed actually going to do that? Um, And has the data that we've seen, you know, the hard data, payrolls, inflation data, ISM data, you know, not just the anecdotal stuff, has it been slow enough to allow the Fed to, to change course so rapidly? Has the inflation data slowed enough, quickly enough for the Fed to, to actually engage in that, in that type of rate cutting cycle uh, starting in March. And Powell last week said it's premature to speculate about easing policy. So I I think there's a very big gap between what the market believes the Fed is about to do and where the Fed sits. And we've seen this and I've talked about this for, you know, for months, Mm -hmm. quarters, Mm -hmm. that the market continuously gets ahead of the Fed and is you know, then slap back into into reality, as I think the Fed, I think the market doesn't uh, understand the Fed's reaction function in a sticky inflation world. The market is is hip to what a QE world looks like and how the Fed addresses slowdowns in growth 
when inflation is is below target, but hasn't done a great job of thinking through what the Fed's reaction function is and remains above target. And I can look back to even, you know, this time last year, the market was only looking for, you know, two to three uh, mm-hmm. hikes for 2020, you know, three. Uh, we got more than that. And you know, we're ending the year significantly higher. And that happened all throughout last year as well. And so, um, I, again, I think we are just, I think the market is run ahead of the Fed. And maybe this is, Maybe this will ultimately be too nuanced of a view, and maybe the data will uh, slow, you know, quite rapidly here uh, this week, next week, and all the data we get, and it will just be uh, an economic d- disaster. And oil is certainly, we can talk more about that, but oil prices mm-hmm. are certainly suggesting something more uh, concerning as well. And we've been noting that for, you know, for weeks too. Um, but, you know, the, I don't know, the preponderance of evidence to me, doesn't suggest that the, the economy has slowed rapidly enough to begin that rate cutting cycle. And now, look, the market's looking for you know seventy five percent chance of a rate cut by by March. And so, um, we'll learn next week from the Fed whether it in- embraces this market pricing or not. Um, I don't think it's going to. I think it's going to try to push back. I think they, they'll do that through the use of the dot plot. Um, they, they did that uh, on the September meeting when they didn't confirm. Uh, the rate cuts that the market was expecting four rate cuts. The Fed went said we're only going to do two. Uh, right now, the market's expecting five. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think the market. I don't think the Fed's going to endorse that view. They're, I think they're also likely to say um, that long-term yields, which had been moving higher and were assisting their tightening regime, now are actually going the other way and are no longer assisting them. So I think they'll make some some acknowledgement of that. So I'm concerned about that type of. Uh, reaction from the Fed after we've seen, you know, basically an all asset rally uh, over the last, uh, you know, several weeks. Uh, but, you know, we still need to balance that with the the positive seasonal dynamics, which we've talked about from a flows perspective as options expiry next week. There's the big expiry at the end of the year. There's January expiry. There, there's all sorts of uh, Santa Claus type of uh, stuff going on from a structural point of view about, you know, dealer buybacks and gamma, you know, with these data and charm flows, et cetera, that, that we've talked about a fair bit. So, um, that's the, uh, I guess that's the lay of the land. As far as the data this week has been, um, you know, we had a st- pretty strong services ISM figure that came out, uh, which I thought folks would, uh, you know, trade off of that they didn't, they've been more uh, inclined to look at this deterioration in the labor data and say, see, the labor data is slowing, the Fed needs to cut rates, uh, now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's, I think where, you know, where we are um, outside of the U.S., I think is interesting in that I suspect that part of the bond strength we're seeing and part of the concern about growth is stemming from, you know, uh, European weakness in their economy. And there's been a drastic shift in the rate cutting uh, expectation from the ECB over the course of the last uh, several weeks. And even the, the one of the, the, the known hawks, Schnabel, this week basically said, you know, Kind of throwing, kind of throwing the towel on 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 the rate hikes too. So uh, it seems like European growth is is way worse than the U.S. growth, um, and I suspect that is part of the kind of global growth consternation. And then in China, similarly, you know, we're not really getting a bounce back in activity that that people thought. The PMIs are lackluster. There, there's talks of you know into year end property and wealth management product and liquidity issues. So you know, unlikely to get much in the way of a global growth momentum coming out of China ahead of Chinese New Year. Maybe we'll have to wait until after Chinese New Year. So um, I think global growth is, is is a way bigger concern than U.S. growth at this point. But it, it is possible that uh, the recession that, that folks have been pricing, uh, calling for for over a year you know, may actually, we may actually, you know, be there. And on Friday, we'll get the payroll print. Um, I think after the ADP number, expectations are probably declining uh, for this print currently in markets at 185 versus 150 last month, I'd say it's bias probably lower now after ADP. Um, so, you know, we'll see. It's a, it, it's again, I, I think the market is desirous of a Fed rate cutting cycle. It's always wants more liquidity. And the question is, is the Fed ready to deliver that? I'm inclined to say no, but I would say all bets are off if we get a really disastrous payroll print on Friday. Uh, it would be hard for the Fed to not endorse the market pricing. All right, I've got a, I've got a screen up right now that I want you to take a look at. Hopefully, you can uh, see it. Yeah. Is that okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So you're just talking about kind of the PMI manufacturing um, 
as well as this kind of like rotation that's going on as well with, you know, out of cyclical growth and into cyclical value. Any comments on that since you just kind of topped off some of the economic print data in uh, ISM services? Yeah, I think this rotation trade that is, is has started to some degree is a bit more flows related, timing related, positioning related than it is uh, something structural or fundamental uh, in the economy. I mean, I would I would imagine that if the bond market and oil markets are saying we are rapidly going to be getting into uh, a more of a recessionary environment, historically that's not been the time to uh, buy cyclical buy cyclicals. Uh, by small caps, by crappy levered companies. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones that new, are bouncing you know, right now strongly. And, and, and so <laughs> these are the things that are that are bouncing, you know, quite aggressively. And we've seen drastic outperformance of IWM versus Qs and, and the most shorted baskets over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, and you know, it feels a little bit more like uh, positioning. There's been some discussion about, you know, uh, just mutual funds, year ends are, many of them are, October 30th, October 31st, they need to wait a month before they, um, you know, can re- reinitiate things that they sold in October for tax loss purposes to not trigger tax wash sale rules. So um, anything that they sold in October, which was a horrible month, they needed to wait until 30, you know, 30 days. So sometime the end of November or beginning of December before they could buy some of that stuff back. Uh, so that's been, I think, maybe part of it. You know, there's been obviously drastic outperformance all year by Mag7 stock. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, seeing some under, underperformance. And I think this is the yeah, Mag7, by the way, just to the, kind of put that ratio up. The massive outperformance from that November 1st, right up until recently, where it's starting to soften. And when I say soften, right at that exact November 2021 high before we pulled back 35% in NASDAQ. Yeah. So that's the the, the max yeah. step that you're talking about. That's a ratio that I, that I like right. to very closely. Yeah, There's also this dynamic, I think that, so the S&P has largely done nothing now since, uh, mm. I guess, like November 20th. So we're basically like two weeks right at this 45, 50 zone. So if you think yeah. about, and and that's not that's like the basically right now where like the zero gamma line is. There's a ton of OI at forty five fifty. So if you think about like what's going on, it's like vol and S and P's are kind of pinned at forty five fifty. Um, and so on the days where you know, there's some data point that's better or worse, and if 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 that means it's a out of growth trade, we need you know as Apple and Microsoft sell off a little bit. Uh, IWMs and value need to go up a lot to balance that, right? Because you figure yes. at, at, at forty five fifty needs to stay. Yeah, you bring those you bring those mega caps down a little. Well, you need to bring the Russell up a lot to balance mm-hmm. that because basically Apple is the market cap of the of the Russell. So I think that's a bit. And then then the, on the next day, like yesterday, you you're stuck again at forty five fifty. It was bad data, so value got hit. Uh, small caps got hit. Big but caps we went have... up. So so we're getting this kind of this yes. jostling back and forth. But it's important that CTAs are part of this. In other words, they're selling into this. They came in extremely short, right, into that October 27th print. And when they started to cover aggressively and everyone started really scampering for the the, the, the call action, it was outside skew. Uh, they have the past few weeks as we've gone so- sideways sold into it very clearly. CTAs have been reducing their yep. length into this. It's very clear we get that 4,600 you know, um, call wall. We have that kind of JP Morgan pin around 4,500. It's pretty wide, that 100 point range, but we haven't even been able to move outside of about 40, 45 points. And this is actually the convexity now in the CTA profile is to the downside. So we have the corporate buybacks that you had mentioned for weeks, right? We're in the, the, the largest of the the season of the year are in December, even if there were less this yeah. you know year than last year, it was still a hundred billion. CTAs had like many hundreds of billions, but I think they they deployed um, a, a good amount of that. So we we have had the perfect storm into this December print. Um, so you know you you always like to do and do a really great job of kind of managing the macro triggers with the micro flows, for lack of a better word. And this CTA positioning right now uh, doesn't mean we're going to fall apart and they're going to turn uh, into sellers. We need a macro trigger, but they are right now absolutely, you know, mo- as we move yeah. sideways, it's sold to you. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Look, I mean, they're, they're, we still have, you know, there's a huge expiry next week and year end. And so, and then in January, there, there's massive expiry for single stock because many of the leaps are, are struck in January. So there's, there's a positive seasonal dynamic from a, and, and we've, and the markets are up this year. So there's, you know, collateralized gain, uh, redeployment of capital mm-hmm. uh, as you start the year. So that there's a reason why we get this Santa Claus rally, January effect type thing. And so it makes it harder for markets to go down where we're, you know, kind of lowering the probability of a left tail event. Um, but there is still a lot of macro going on that could disrupt that dynamic. Um, yeah. And that, that typically has to be driven by either the Fed or the Treasury. Uh, the Treasury is is out of uh, mm-hmm. out of purview right now. They basically have announced their schedule of of debt supply. We know we know it from now until the end of January. So we don't really get another update from Treasury until the end of January. Um, so the Fed is really the only thing, the only entity. I think that could deliver some sign of macro surprise. And so I think what they could deliver is we don't endorse the market's view about a rate cutting cycle beginning imminently. Um, And I think that could be something that is a concern for markets, you know, really, you know, from next week into the end of the, you know, maybe into the end of the year. Um, Now, I think if the Fed were to endorse this rate cutting cycle, um, you know, I think some people have have, have said, well, we've traveled, we've, we've traveled so far, if they finally say, yes, we're ready to cut, then it's time to, it's a sold to you. I don't know. I think that ultimately is really more of a January thing. I think if the mm-hmm. Fed comes in and says they're going to do five cuts next year, this market's going to make an all, you know, this market's going to make an all-time high before the end of the year. <laughs> um, we're only 5% because, from there yeah, now. So and, no, and I, I, I mean, it, might, it would happen next week, right? And so, because yeah. I don't, you know, and it would be driven by, you know, the crap would, would really squeeze you know everybody at any last remaining sure to be squeezed out that's um, that's when it basically needs to top is the euphoria you know the shorts cover and euphoria yeah i think, momentum. That, I think we don't even have that. the euphoria yet we don't even have, so but i want we're starting about- to get we were starting to get I was listening to uh jem carson talk about this uh in, in a webinar today but we are starting to see some dynamics of market up vol up which is something that he is he's talked about um as being you know part of the ending move Mm-hmm. Um, but, but you're right. I don't think we've experienced anything that would be described as euphoria. Um, I think we're what we're experiencing now is pain, pain yes. trades, right? People who have been short, um, you know, crappy names or people who were short bonds all year have gotten their faces ripped off in the last six weeks. Anyone who's been short crap has been crushed. Anyone who was long oil and energy, you know, all year has gotten destroyed the last week. Anyone who was short gold has gotten crushed, right? So there's been a lot of pain. And if you've been long mag seven and that's been your long leg, uh, like the Goldman VIP basket is heavily long mag seven, um, that's really underperformed now for the last week and a half. So there's been a lot of pain, positioning pain, um, you know, here for, you know, the, the hedge fund crowd and for the, the long mm-hmm. short crowd. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you've been just long stocks, you, 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 you know, the long risk you, you've done, you know, you've done okay. But for the, you know, for the marginal long short guys, it's not been an easy last two weeks here as the markets have, kind of, as risk has continued to rally. So on this um, point that you, you're picking up from Sam, it's, it's really actually important that IV continues to move closer closer to realized volatility, there was a very wide gap. So this, you know, VIX crush that we experienced in November outsized um, has now obviously that that gap has widened between uh, I realized, but the is there is also the the, the unemployment rate, which is not expected expected to surprise um, with a refreshing, a recession nod, but uh, it had been the SOM rule, right? That if we were going to, you know, trigger 4%, we would get much closer because we had, we've come up off the bottom for 3.5 to 3.9% in October. Because we had a few months there where it actually um, kind of removed her baseline rule of momentum, you know, continuing, 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 it actually now rise, raises that threshold to 4.3%. So we would actually need a 4.3% um, un- unemployment rate to trigger an official recession. We're not going to get that this Friday. I mean, we're at 39 yeah. from October. We might hit that four. That's fine. Um, but we're not yet into that, um, you know, I would say volatility inducing of size so anything above four would absolutely, I, I think, create some more disturbance in December. Otherwise, I hear you. The flows are very supportive 
until December um, expiration. And then because of all the leaps in January, they're pretty much supportive until the, you know, the January. Middle of January yeah. yeah. But at some point they're going to front run the, um, the, the potential danger of QRA. And that whole theme for me of this rotation from growth to value, because it forces a lot of the hedge funds to cover short, very profitable shorts, and the VIP trades get sold, that concentration risk, they're at 99 percentile for hedge funds in their, you know, uh, holdings of Magnificent Seven, that actually can create volatility as well, long before the January OPEX. So that's the one that we're kind of playing in the trading room. Um, that's been a lot of fun, actually. So for for once, you get a two-way market, even if it's just those two sectors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, look, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of cross currents, uh, you know, here between now and the end of the year, both on the macro side and on the flow side that need to be, uh, you know, understood and respected. But um, can you comment on this chart? Also, this repo spike that happened yesterday? Did you see that or any? Yeah, uh, any it came back to down that? today. There okay. had been some, um, look, th there is a a issue that happens at the end of every year where banks start to cut their risk for regulatory purposes and for capital charge purposes. Um, and so their ability to lend balance sheet to clients starts to get reduced. And so there's some, there were some issues on liquidity and, you know, over month end, November month end that kind of stayed around a little bit longer into the early part of December. And so it's possible. And look, that was, I think that I, even though that chart looks uh, high, mm -hmm. uh, that was, that was $206 million. Uh, mm -hmm. So not, not really that, not a lot. Not really that okay. much, All right. um, but, but there is a, there is something to be just, you know, understood about dealer, about the primary dealers are, are being forced to take on more of the T-bill issuance that we've seen um, over the course of the last several weeks. And so the fact that the big banks have to buy more of these auctions because the yields are not as attractive uh, for money market investors uh, as much anymore uh, does create a potential funding issue as we kind of turn into uh, the end of the year. So it is something I think people are kind of watching. I don't really think it's something systemic, but it does create another, you know, potential headwind as we turn, you know, it, it's a balancing force against these positive system flows is that banks are not going to be able to provide as much low cost leverage to funds over the end of the year. And so may force some position reductions and some, you know, risk asset price deterioration as folks are forced to delever into year end. So it's just another thing we got to kind of keep on the on the radar screen. And speaking of which, speaking of, you know, year end and moving forward, this is a year over year revenue growth um, came down to 3.1% for Q4 of this year, which is way below estimates of 3.9% uh, revenue growth, revenue growth that was uh, uh, from September 30th. Any comments on this as we move forward into yeah. the next journey season? Yeah, look, I mean, we're, we're going to go from a 5% plus GDP economy in the third quarter to something that looks like 1% in the fourth quarter to where each month is getting worse than the last month, right? We're exiting December at a rate that's worse than we started October. And we're likely to get, um, you know, zero or negative one in the first quarter. So, you know, correlation of S and P revenue growth to P is pretty is pretty high. Uh, we're going to see a continued deterioration in S and P revenue outlook in 4Q over 3Q and then in 1Q 24 uh, versus 4Q. And so if if the top line is not accelerating, and there's really very limited reason to believe that, that it will accelerate as soon as the first quarter, um, I think that that creates uh, a problem for the earnings growth outlook uh, as we exit the year and kind of move into, into 2024. Now, if financial conditions, which have been incredibly loose over the course mm -hmm. of the last six weeks, basically are they're as loose now as they, they've been uh, mm -hmm. since the beginning of the tightening cycle. If, they, if this continues, then there, there will be a positive, eventual positive reaction in the economy to such a loosening of financial conditions, right? You can imagine a scenario where mortgage rates, you know, plow, they, I think they're close to having a six handle. And then if, mm -hmm. if the Fed's going to cut, they probably go to, you know, low sixes. And that, that there'll be a, an economic acceleration that comes from that loosening of financial conditions, which would allow for 
her, you know, earnings to probably trough in the first quarter of 24 and start to reaccelerate uh, as we move through 24. So again, this is very uh, important for the Fed to understand how how quickly are they going to be responding to this concern about about growth. Um, and, you know, it, you, we could, we could try to forecast and try to project, but you know, the truth is we'll, we'll just know more when they, when they announce it, because yeah. um, it, it's, it, these guys have flip-flopped in the past. Let's, let's put it mildly. Yes. I mean, it's not. But this been... is also why so many companies, some would say zombies and, uh, you know, unprofitable tech or just very, very poor performing Russell is still alive and kicking from that loose financial conditions. So uh, this is also why that kind of oversold play right now, uh, why hedge funds have shorted them so aggressively. They've been great shorts. They have been decelerating, um, you know, de <laughs> extended yeah. downtrends. Let's just put it that way. So uh, this backdrop of rate cuts, where since we've had this pummeling of the 10 year down into the 4.1 handle, I think it overshoots to 4%. Now everyone's you know, jumping on the bandwagon saying, oh, was a, today was basically nearly a record call buying day in TLT, which is wild. It, it, right as approaches the 200 um, yeah. day, which is kind of silly. But in any case, what I wanted to show was um, that, oh, where is it? The oil chart, because yield, there we go. Uh, yields have been cratering since that five handle. Uh, and it's been very much November 1st, right? The, the Fed intonated pause and the Yellen Yahtzee with more T-bills than bonds. But now oil has absolutely rolled over um, with vigor. So yields and oil down, economy seems soft patch, maybe soft landing, and uh, Fed cuts are you know in, in the forecast. But is it to avoid a hard landing or is it to actually just keep up with this decelerating inflation that they're so proud of that they've impacted? I mean, it, as far as rationale for um, the, the cuts, I know we get way too many yeah. of them priced in, but this is not necessarily uh, reacting to that. But try and tie that in for me, because obviously yeah. both have crashed. I think it's it's... Look, I mean, people have been calling for this economy to uh, slow aggressively as we've taken rates above 5%, and it's not happened yet. And so the question is, is it just not going to happen? Or is it just delayed for a variety of reasons? I think we can even go back to kind of this rationale about inflation, it, how inflation was rising, and everyone thought it was transitory. And then all of a sudden, it's not transitory, it stays with us for longer, it forces the Fed to react. And now inflation is falling. And it's likely that a lot of the inflation was transitory. It just took more than the the typical amount of lag for the uh, prices to you know to start falling. And I think the same similar thing is happening here with the tightening. Is that I don't think that there are things in this economy that are make it imper you know impervious to uh, slowing from rate rate hikes. I mean, there are a lot of people who are struggling with these rate hikes in the housing market, consumer credit cards are starting to become an issue, delinquencies, you know, auto repossessions are, are rising. Um, and various companies are, you know, starting to small companies, bankruptcies are rising, right? So at the at the edges of this economy, there has been an impact from from these higher rates. And as we move into 2024 and 2025, and really every day that goes by, another person and another company is going to be affected because their, you know, their mortgage is up or their loan is maturing, right? And so we're going to start to cycle the, you know, the benefit that uh, companies and households have by by locking in low rates in the middle of 2020 or end of 2020 or early to one. Um, and it will crimp the economy even further. So I think we are going to have a slowdown. Um, and the question then becomes, can the Fed engineer, you know, land the plane in a perfect way such that we just have a soft landing uh, that doesn't reignite inflation expectation? Or are they going to basically crash the plane? And it's 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 hard to tell. I mean, I think there are um, reasons to look. I think if you believe that the economy is slowing as rapidly as maybe oil and bonds are saying, you would say the Fed needs to cut now uh, in order to prevent this crash landing. Mm -hmm. And if oil is on the floor, uh, which it has been, and inflation expectations are falling, as they have been because commodities are soft, then then this would not be a bad time for them to 
you know, to at least, to at least try it. The question is, as rates fall and the housing market then reaccelerates and the dollar falls and oil puts a bottom in, how quickly are those inflation expectations just going to reunite again? And so if they cut now, are they going to be raising rates at the end of 2024 because inflation is back to three, four percent? I think there is a very high likelihood that that is what would happen. I mean, there are structural things going on in the global economy from a deglobalization point of view, from a building out supply chains point of view, from you know a- an increase in geopolitical tension point of view that would suggest that we need to do a lot more spending and we need to do a lot more uh, inflationary spending. Um, you know, in the future. So I think there would be a risk that if the Fed cuts too soon, that inflation does reaccelerate. But if they don't cut soon, there is a growing risk that keeping the economy too tight for too long is going to lead to a larger recession, a larger slowdown, more layoffs. Unemployment rate doesn't stop at 4.3%. It stops at 5.3 or Mm 6.3 because, you know, we've really, we've really cracked this economy. I I think there's a risk of that too. So um, I think it's, it is hard to, uh, you know, exactly right now what the Fed's going to do, but they continue to say inflation is their number one concern. You go around the country People are still complaining about prices being too high. Uh, and I think that there is a still an impetus at the Fed to not be in a position where it is re it, 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 it it's allowing for the reacceleration of inflation, creating an environment that is raising rates again next year after it has cut them. Right. I just I don't think that that's an environment that they want to get into. I think they're more likely to press a little bit, allow for the slowdown to happen, which they've been talking about for a while. They mm-hmm. said pain was needed, um, put a little pain in, and then feel a little bit more comfortable that when they do cut, it's not going to ignite these inflation. Look, house prices have not fall- really fallen enough, right? I mean- No, they haven't, but- that's this- the, I think that's a, major, it, that, that's a major concern because I think immediately- But it's when, our, also our best inflationary asset for most right? of us. And- but immediately when they cut rates and mortgage rates fall, there's going to be a resurgence of folks who have been left out of the housing market yeah. who go yeah. right back into it. And house prices are just going to go right back up again. So I'm not, I don't really know if that's the, what they're looking to, to do with their policy, with, with policy, but I mean, that is a, that is a possibility. I just want to um, kind of highlight this tweet that I sent out. Actually, a client sent me this information. So it was very interesting. Basically uh, right now, about 4.30 or 4.45 or something, um, House is going to vote on this, which is limiting EPA ability to set vehicle emission standards. Right now, they're really, really pushing for um, a reduction in internal combustion engines in the next 10 years. So it's a very strong um, reason why refiners and others would have difficulty bringing um, or in supporting th- this uh, this market. So I wonder if part of this is just a fundamental underpinning, I mean, of just not enough interest in the oil market because the policies are right now geared against it. So this is just an example. It's literally going to get voted on uh, this afternoon. I just wanted to check the time and uh, it, it's about five o'clock. We'll see yeah. what happens, but it will have an impact. And that's one of the reasons why I think underneath the surface, again, policies dictate price in industries, no question. I think that's under the surface part of this sell-off. Maybe it's by the rumor, uh, sell the news. I'm sorry, yeah, sell the news by the rumor in this particular case. But it, it you know, regardless, there has been a uh, lack of interest in that space as it relates to pricing, despite Israeli yeah. war. Um, it, it's, no, uh, it's, it's, it's I mean, a, I think we, yeah, I think we talked about this, uh, maybe it was, I don't know if it was last time or uh, on, on on one of our edge calls, but it, it is fascinating to see how, from a policy perspective, um, the government is able to uh, continue to kind of attack the energy industry in a variety of different ways, you know, whether it's through, you know, these type of regulations or the SPR release and restock. Mm-hmm. And yet when it comes to technology and it comes to the mag seven stocks they um, let them run and, free. And, and, and taxing them in order to, you know, grow revenues or, you know, for the government, there is, they are, they are literally nowhere to be found. Right. It is mm-hmm. unbelievable. And I think from an investor point of view, you, you know, when the government has no ability to really regulate or tax a certain part of the economy, at, at least at versus another part of the economy, investors kind of pick up on that. And so the idea that, 
technology continues to outperform energy from a structural multi-year perspective and kind of makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, if you're never going to tax Apple and Microsoft in, in a way, you know, force them to bring cash home and tax them appropriately or or tax them on or, or regulate on AI or do any of these things, then you're you're gonna it's gonna be hard. It's going to be hard to see an environment where we structurally close that valuation discrepancy or that outperformance discrepancy. All right, you're getting a question about gold. So I'm looking for a few charts to bring up to kind of uh, represent. Um, but one right away, put this over here, is Bitcoin, the, the digital gold. That one came right up. So let me just share this and then talk to, because you did th the right thing. You said basically one of your ways that you are representing uh, duration in your portfolio is through long gold and Bitcoin. So first, I know they're different, but let's talk about both of them here. Right. So here's a chart of Bitcoin, which is obviously um, hot fire flames. Actually, 42,000 was kind of monthly uh, resistance. And it went right above that just before Jamie Dimon uh, presented in front of Congress today that, you know, he he thinks it should be outlawed. That yeah. was And the black Rock ETF comes in at some point in January, which this supports, you know, buy the rumor, maybe sell the news. But regardless, you have used it structurally brilliantly and I as a as a long duration trade with gold. So talk about these two um kind of gold like assets. Yeah. Well, look, I think that and projection for the 2024 that's being I mean, asked. both of them really uh, look part of the the reason that I had been concerned about U.S. Treasuries um, as an investment class it has to do with the the supply demand imbalances that exist. Right, Treasury is um, continuing to grow its deficits uh, really at an accelerating pace from you know for from now until forever. The levels of debt that need to be refinanced every year are growing exponentially. Foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries uh, is declining and more price sensitive buyers are being forced to kind of take up the slack. So it's it's made it hard Who for are me. They, by the way. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I mean and hedge, you know, hedge funds and 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 re, you know and, re, and retail and pensions and domestic players, right? So, yeah. um it's been harder for me, you know, it, and and the other thing the other thing treasury has done uh by sanctioning our, you know, Russia and mm -hmm. our, our "Quote unquote enemies." Um, now, Russia is an enemy. I, I concede, but um, there are other foreign actors who can very easily find themselves in being labeled an enemy of the U.S. government. I mean, we basically labeled nearly every country um, an enemy, except for the U.K., a, 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 an enemy since you know World War II. So, it, it's not some you know it shouldn't be too surprising that if you're Saudi or if you're UAE or if you're China um where who have major surpluses with the US that you may over time not want to hold those surpluses in US treasuries anymore the volatility of treasuries is too high they're they're debasing the value of treasuries and they and oh by the way if you do something that the US government doesn't like, they may just take them away from you or mm -hmm. or, or, or freeze them. And so from a structural point of view, I, I, I've been saying, okay, we're, we're losing the US Treasury as the exclusive um, neutral reserve asset in the world. And investors are looking for alternatives to store reserves. And so the, the most likely uh, candidates for that are gold, which is kind of withstood mm -hmm. the test of time. Um, Bitcoin, which is kind of you know uh, digital gold. I don't know, but it, it, it's it, it it's been around now for you know a long period of time. It's, it doesn't fail. Uh, every you know there's having cycles going on. Uh, we understand the supply outlook. Uh, so that's been and you know a kind of a a call option on on the gold. It, uh, idea. Swiss francs have been another place, right? So so the, so global investors are looking for alternatives to US treasuries to store wealth. That's been the structural underpinning of my reasoning for owning gold and Bitcoin as opposed to treasuries. Now, you know, over the course of the last six weeks, as you know, after Yellen came out and said, well, we're going to issue less duration, we're going to do more bills and the economy has slowed a little bit and the Fed has backed off its hiking, treasuries have rallied massively. And so you know, you could have said, well, you, your view, Craig, was wrong. Bonds, bonds have rallied. You, you thought you higher. And my, my, my answer to that would be that, that, that that's great. They've, they've rallied for whatever reason. Gold and Bitcoin have way outperformed even on a volatility adjusted basis. So I picked up that 
kind of idea about duration, but I'm used, but it still kind of fits with my more secular view about this trend away from uh, U.S. Treasuries as a neutral reserve settlement asset for you know global trade. So as we as we move into next year, I think both are going to continue to do incredibly well. Uh, in a slowing economy where where rates are falling, um, you know they'll you know they're they're both zero yielding assets, right? So if you're if you think interest rates are going to fall, you're you know you, you're you lose the yield benefit from owning uh, bonds versus gold and and Bitcoin. We understand the supply growth environment for both gold and for Bitcoin, and next year the supply growth in Bitcoin is is getting cut in half. Um, and from a demand perspective, these ETF demands are just going to kind of institutionalize the uh, you know the demand flows for for Bitcoin, um, you know, over the course of the next year. So I'm, I'm kind of pro- positively inclined on both of them. Gold is really the uh, asset for central banks and mm-hmm. Bitcoin is really the asset for the people. Um, so I think they both kind of win in those environments. And if, you know, if you're a emerging market citizen in a variety of different countries that are increasingly experiencing strife, warfare, a variety of other things, and you need to flee with your money, uh, Bitcoin is really the only thing that you could do and go with it. And as we're seeing with the Ukraine or with Gaza or whoever knows what what next will happen on the geopolitical front, um, those are becoming real uh, situations for for global citizens if they if they're being forced to flee, how do they leave with the, any wealth? This is the really Bitcoin is the only way for them to do that. So I think both of those uh both of those will continue to benefit from from inflows and the size of bitcoin as an asset class is just is infinitesimal uh versus versus you know global bonds global gold i mean I think gold's a 15 or so trillion dollar market cap bitcoin is i think not even a trillion so i mean there's plenty of room for for bitcoin to take share from gold and for both of them to take share from bonds uh, U.S. Treasuries over time as, as we as we continue to transition away from uh the, the treasury asset as being the global reserve asset. I have to pop in with this because uh, Jeffrey has a thesis that he thinks they are selling China plays um, and buying Bitcoin. <laughs> so that's his, that's his kind of like a uh, pair trade. Even if I would, does it not even come up over here? Even if I just do GBTC, it can kind of whoosh. But anyway, China is um, as an asset class right now, or those uh, Chinese ADRs are in on the ground and they just have not been able to get back up um, any suggestions, timing on when that will start to turn? Right now, I'm just looking for Bitcoin to turn and then the Chinese ADRs get bid back up potentially. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not a fan of these Chinese ADRs uh, and really, you know, haven't been um, for a long time. I just, I don't know. Look, China, the, in, in the US, we care about stocks, right? I mean, like asset prices are the like the way the US works uh, mm-hmm. stocks, everyone, you know, stocks are the way us work. You know, we basically have 401k flows from employees just go right into the stock market. There's this positive hyper financialization, you know, reflexivity trade where, uh, America works when the stock market works. It, China's just not built that way. China's equity market is not the same as the U S equity market. They don't have similar types of structural flows. Um, you know, Chinese wages are, are, are moving higher. Um, and, Chinese equity culture is just not, it's just not really there um, as, as to the degree that it is here. And so if, if Chinese domestics aren't being forced into buy it and global investors don't really feel like they need to, like, I just don't know what's going to be at this point, the structural uh, catalyst. And if the US and China are going to continue to have, you know, basically a, an economic warfare against each other, and, you know, you run the risk of, you know, further sanctions or stopping the investment flows or technology transfer issues, you know, US investors are going to continue to to shy away from from China. So I'm just I don't know. I just I mean you know yes we can get oversold bounces off trades from here and from there and there and the certain times of the year or but I, I don't know. It doesn't doesn't Dean, really make, Dean makes doesn't a good really point. No, that they're still quote unquote uninvestable, but they're extremely oversold from a valuation standpoint anyway. But PDD has been working well. That's for darn sure. That's one Chinese um, ADR that has been allowed to rise. Um, and he does mention, you know, China recently cut capital gains and trying to make their own version of 401ks and IRAs. 
So, um, or sorry, capital gains tax. Yeah. They've done a lot of 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 boosting of the consumer uh, capital markets. Um, I would say consumer sentiment and capital markets, but the real estate market is still the be all end all, right? So, um, it is it is interesting. While Baba has suffered immensely, PDD has been allowed to uh, rise up. But um, anyway, that that pair trade I thought was kind of interesting. They're shorting Chinese uh, ADRs and they're buying Bitcoin. But you have explained your Bitcoin thesis. Um, as well as gold, are you bullish the miners yet? I mean, look, I think there is, they're, they're just levered, you know, they're just levered. They're even further levered plays, right? I mean, so, you know, at times there, they are, there is good catch up trades when you're looking for some leverage, you know, you know, GDX will outperform when uh, gold prices are ripping higher, like they did last week and the week before, but. That's because interest rates also but, fell over. So that's. Yeah, that's no, I mean, look, I think that, very that's, much. but. Or extraction you know, and all that. Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm positive on miners, but I, I you know, more, I'm generally just like to own the just Got like it. to own the like to own the asset out. Uh, and as far on, as Bitcoin, and as far as Bitcoin mm -hmm. is concerned, I will. I, I don't really the Bitcoin equities. I don't think are are very good uh, representations of. Bitcoin. I'd rather just own Bitcoin. I, I, that, there, I, I, I don't I don't buy Mara and Riot or MSTR and the rest. Yeah, I, MSTR is actually inter more, would be more interesting only because it, I, I think. He He's actually doing a reasonably good job of raising equity when his stock trades at a premium to NAV and he goes and he buys Bitcoin with it. I think that he actually has a, an interesting strategy. The, other, the, the miners, I just don't, I, I don't know. Got it. They just okay, got, I got it. How about the Asian uh, currencies? Right here, I've got the dollar yuan, the dollar yen on weekly time frames. They have uh, intervened so far and the, these uh, pairs have started to soften. What's what's your call for moving into the new year? Will Bank of Japan do anything? <laughs> um, but more importantly, this has definitely uh, helped the dollar uh, fade with yields, U.S. yields and equities and bonds get bid together. Yeah, I think, you know, look, I think the, the trade from... November 1st, you know, accelerated and after the CPI print in November has been dollar weakness, bond strength, uh, equities rallying on back of a, a Fed that will not need to tighten as much as originally feared. Um, and now, you know, likely to be to be cutting imminently. Um, I, I do find it interesting, though, that to me, it seems like the rest of the world's growth dynamics uh, are inferior to the U.S. And, and I, do, I do think it's interesting that I mean, if you look at the DXY, you know, DXY now has is starting to starting to bounce again after this after this dollar sell off and we're back above the two hundred day and and that's you know, the weekly you, that's the daily you know Europe is Europe is worse than the U S and is likely to need to do cutting sooner and more aggressively than than the U S so um, I'm more in the camp that the dollar is likely to you know bounce here uh, into the end of the year and probably to begin uh, next year but that's basically because I think the Fed is not going to be delivering on the rate cutting regime that is being currently priced by the market. So I do find it interesting that in FX land, we're starting to see the dollar bounce already. Uh, and today we saw the two-year yields actually move higher. So you know, is the dollar, our yield starting to say, yeah, maybe we've gone Maybe this pricing is is gone too far uh, as far as expecting too much from the Fed. So we'll see. But I'm more inclined to uh, be dollar. I, I think we're more likely to be dollar bullish for the next few weeks here on a Fed being more hawkish than, than market is priced. All right. Well, I think we have um, oil listening very much to this uh, vote that's going on right now. Just for giggles, take a look. It's continuing to sell off aggressively, which means at some point we should have uh, a little bit of stabilization but uh, when do they they do this kind of it always overshoots <laughs> so yeah. it's definitely catching a falling knife right now um, and I haven't seen the vote but I mentioned it obviously at the top of the hour that they are having uh, you know House Republicans right now introduced a bill to kind of limit EPA and they're having a vote on this um, I just don't see right now if it's underway, but oil is absolutely reacting. I think this might be part of the reason that oil has been selling off very aggressively. Anyway. Yeah. Our uh, look, I think, you know, there's also interesting timing from, from an oil perspective. You have Putin in meeting with Saudi today, uh, UAE yesterday. So yeah, yeah I, I I'd be, I would imagine they have the oil price up on there, you know, while they're, while they're talking. Um, 
I also learned that the Russian central bank head accompanied Putin uh, on this trip to Saudi. So, mm. you know, if you think about the Russia, China, Saudi, gold for oil, away from dollar type conspiracy theories that, that we've touched on uh, all year and, and kind of come in and out of the narrative, I, I do think it, the timing is interesting that, you know, they're crushing the oil market when Putin is meeting with uh, MBS and the head of the central bank is there. We'll see if that becomes something, uh, you know, later on this week or or next week. Okay. And then economic data prints. We've got um, obviously jobless claims tomorrow morning. That's Thursday, 830. We've got non-farm payrolls Friday. Um, and then, of course, before FOMC, we've got one more major one. Uh, what is that? Two C- CPI. Quad- yeah, we have CPI on Tuesday. CPI on Tuesday. And we have two auctions of size, right? Yeah. What are the two yep. auctions next week? Monday and Tuesday. I forget the size. Yeah. Pull that up. But yeah, but that, it's, the- it's, 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 look, next week is, you know, kind of a, a uh, macroeconomic Super Bowl, right? I mean, you basically have the ECB, yeah. you have the Fed, you have CPI, you have massive amount of treasury supply, uh, which will help you know, restock some of the TGA, re- reducing liquidity, you have options expiry. Um, so, you know, it, it'll be it'll be a very big week and markets are up into the right, uh, right into there. Um, we've, we've front run a lot of the Santa Claus rally and the year end dynamics. Um, very much so. so. We're going to need, you know, macro to support the flows um, in order to kind of keep this, you know, keep this going. And look, I think the question is, does it behoove the Fed to continue to loosen financial conditions here at this time of year? Uh, and how does that how does that work with their achieving their their two percent inflation target? I, I've been of the view that the Fed is in the buying time business. Mm-hmm. Well, they said. are looking always to push out the time that they can achieve to give them time to achieve their target, which is to bring inflation down to 2%. When volatility gets too high and markets run the risk of disrupting their agenda by putting in deflationary forces in, in a very large way, asset prices fall, the SVB situation or bonds are falling, whatever, whatever it is, the Fed comes in and sells volatility because it doesn't want to be the reason why markets crash and doesn't want to be that be the reason why inflation falls. Um, and so they are constantly selling volatility when it is elevated. On the flip side, when volatility is incredibly low, uh, like it is now and like it has been at various times over the course of the last two years, it's often been the case that the Fed comes in and basically sells calls and reintro- they basically they, they reintroduce volatility into the market because they don't want a situation where they allow animal spirits to run wild, yeah. where they're too complacent, they loosen financial conditions way too much, and inflation expectations reaccelerate, and then it makes their job even harder. And if you look at the survey-based expectations, like U Michigan survey of inflation expectations, they are sitting at multi-year highs on both the one-year and the five-year, five to ten year forward. So um I think they are they could use this opportunity once again to basically reintroduce some volatility, give themselves some more time to see more data uh that assures that we are not talking about inflation at the time of the election next year, right? And so mm-hmm. um, or that's my bias. That's my, that's my bias. Um, now it's, you know, and I've seen them reintroduce volatility countless times over the course of the last two years. Now, it's mm-hmm. very possible that they will not do that next week, but that would be a change in their reaction function than what they've been doing for the last two years. Typically, I feel like they sig- they like to signal that in advance. And the last thing that we just heard from them was Powell the day before the blackout period saying, quote, it is premature to speculate about policy reduction and easing of rates, cutting rates. So he didn't signal it. So I, I mean, and, and and the five speakers before him as well that weren't Waller also said kind of the same thing. We could tighten again. We're not. We're not looking to cut rates. So I mm-hmm. don't think that they've signaled that they're ready to cut imminently. I think the market is very far ahead of them, and I think the market can be disappointed when they learn that the Fed is not supporting a five rate, a five cut regime next year. Um, but we will see. All right. Well, we will definitely come back after FOMC and we'll do this before the uh, the close of the year. We'll do another macro to micro power hour in a few weeks. 
um, just to kind of close it up. But for now, I think we covered all the, the hot spots and obviously the market, uh, there's no reason to panic in, in, until we have a reason. <laughs> so right now, non-farm payrolls, that's that's Yeah, and look, the only thing, I, other thing I would my... say is we are, we are very close to this zero gamma line, right? We may actually, you know, who knows different, but we're, you know, the 45, 50 level is a big cash, is a big level. Um, we could get into a situation where weakness begets weakness because as we go down where and we we push into negative gamma, dealers are selling into weakness. So, you know, we could we could get into that regime uh quite quickly. And what we know is that over the course of the last few weeks, as vol has come down, these vol control funds have been buying every day. And so they are back to um you know, maybe not full positions, but have been, uh, are very long. Again, the vol control funds are very long. We already talked about CTAs who have been forced yeah. to cover and are more, are more long than not, not are biased to sell if things start to break down. So um, I can't wait because we'll see. I mean, it, 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 look, I mean, it happened in 2018 where we had a fairly sizable correction after, you know, in a year where the markets were basically up all year, uh, at least through the first three quarters of the year, and there was no Santa Claus rally. Um, yeah. and oh, it's definitely not guaranteed. And then and even, la gotten... even, look, even, la even last year, um, we, the market had a very bad second half of December last year, folks remember, from the, from the Fed meeting to the end of the year, markets were down uh, a lot. So uh, it's, it's not, like you said, it's not written in stone uh, that we no. need to rally into year end, but we but do I, have to acknowledge that the flows are are fairly us. And we have to acknowledge that we have we had many gaps to fill on the way up. This was a major one, which was the April 1st rollover on the QRA, right? With all that massive issuance of bonds. August, August 1st, yeah. August, oh, so sorry, August yeah. 1st, absolutely. And this was absolutely the price target. We had to get up into this 45.75 um target area which was the gap fill 4575 anyway we did we've gone sideways we've gone a little above it below it but the point is when we start to turn and roll over we're not there yet obviously CTAs are kind of sold to you they've they've done their work corporate buybacks we're entering the blackout period the fed blackout period the year end it's pretty much over for many anyway the point is we have massive number of gap on the way down That'll be fun. But first we need to turn. <laughs> so, um, all right. So that's it. We, we we kind of captured, I think, all the highlights. Um, and we'll uh, we'll touch base in a few weeks. Thank you so much for joining again. Uh, this is our Macro Advisor Edge review and Macro to Micro Power Hour for our um, Q&A purposes. Hope you get some uh, some good data out of this as well as some good trade ideas as we move into the end of the year. Just, you know, no hero here worshiping. This is, this is going to be a Christmas to remember um, if we just uh, pace ourselves. We really don't have any major drama coming in except um, the, uh, the, the payroll print. That's my baseline focus right now. Um, and anything else for you into year end? Are you just going to kind of no surprises for right now? Yeah, look, I mean, I do think like I don't. I, I meant hero worshiping yeah. by Santa Claus. Yeah, no, look, <laughs> I mean, I, I think I, I think at this point the the market would be surprised by a more hawkish Fed than being priced in. So I would be more. I would be surprised if the Fed embraces the market's pricing of a rate cutting cycle. So um, we'll you know we'll, we'll we'll see. Now look, I mean, between now and the Fed meeting, we could sell off also, <laughs> you know, and maybe we, we, you know, we change the setup. But right now, you know, if we were kind of just to be here, I, I think the Fed, uh, a five, five cut regime is not going to be endorsed, but maybe by, by next, you know, Tuesday, depending on the CPI, maybe we're down at, you know, less than four cuts and then the dynamic changes again. So it's possible that that could happen. We have payrolls is a big print. We've CPI'd before the Fed. So it's not, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot going on. Yes. Well, again, everyone, happy holidays. And thank you again for joining us. Cheers. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye. Subscribe to LaDuke Trading YouTube channel for more macro to micro power hour videos and other content.